Welcome back students. We continue here our study of unit number one, the properties and transformations of matter. In this section, we're going to talk about measurements. All of the math that we do in chemistry typically deals with not abstract quantities, but what we call measurements. So a measurement is going to consist of two parts. It's going to have a number and it's going to have a unit. And the units of measurement that we use depend on the system. So we have the metric system, which is used worldwide. The common or English system, which is the one that we use generally here in the United States. And then the international system or SI, which is the one the scientific community would like to embrace most of the time. So let's take some examples of this. How do we measure length, the amount of space between two points? Well, in the metric system, we use the meter and we abbreviate it with a small m. In English system, we have feet, we have inches, we have yards, we have miles, and so forth. In the SI system, the unit of choice is the meter. And one of the things we'll learn is that we have these so-called equivalent statements, like this one here that we have. One meter equals 3.281 feet. How about mass? Well, mass as a property, without going into deep physics, let's say it is simply the amount of matter in a, in a sample. In the metric system, we use grams, abbreviated G, but of course, in the English system, we're more accustomed to pounds, and of course, ounces also. The SI system utilizes the kilogram, but one kilogram is essentially 1,000 grams, which is equivalent itself to 2.205 pounds. One of the things that we have to wrestle with is that really pounds are measures not of mass, but of weight. On the surface of the earth, mass and weight are the same. Weight represents essentially the effect of gravity on a given mass. So technically they're not the same, but on the face, on the surface of the earth, it doesn't really matter. Now, for example, an astronaut who weights 190 pounds, that is equivalent to about 86 kilograms. Well, that's on the surface of the Earth. In outer space, that astronaut would have zero pounds of weight. However, it would still have, I mean, sorry, he, he or she would still have 86 kilograms of mass. We don't have to worry about that because we're not gonna be doing experiments in outer space anyway, all right? All right. Volume is the amount of space occupied by a sample of matter. Remember, we define matter as something that has mass and occupies space. Well, the space occupied is a property we can measure. We call it the volume. In the metric system, we're gonna use the units of liters, capital L. In the English system, we have quarts, fluid ounces, etc., etc. And you can see here the conversion between a quart and 0 0.946 liters. The SI system utilizes the more traditional definition of volume, which is the product of the width times the height times the depth of a sample. And so they expressed it in cubic meters. Some properties actually represent ratios of other properties. Density is a very useful property because pretty much every substance has a unique density, the ratio of the mass of the sample to the volume that it occupies. And we're familiar with units such as grams per cubic centimeter, which sometimes says abbreviated CC, or grams per milliliter. As I said, it's a useful property for identifying substances. Now, there is another actor on the stage of chemistry that we have kind of neglected up till now, and that is energy. We said that chemistry is the study of the properties and transformations of matter. And in our first uh, lecture, set of lectures, we talked about physical and chemical changes. Well, any time that matter is changed in any way, whether physical or chemical, work has been done. And once more, to give a simple definition of work, let's say it is the action of a force through a distance. In other words, energy is the capacity to do work, to move things around. And as we'll see in a little bit, also to transfer heat. So when an employee at a warehouse is moving a crate, pushing it across the floor, that force acting through a distance represents work that is done by the employee on that crate. 
Just like we classify matter, we can classify energy also. We can say there is kinetic energy and there's potential energy. Kinetic energy is the energy associated with the motion of an object. And potential energy is associated with the position or composition of an object. Sometimes we think of potential energy as energy that is stored. In other words, you are not seeing it in action, but there is the potential there to generate work. Now, uh, there is a special kind of energy, we'll discuss it in a few moments, called thermal energy. It is kinetic, it has to do with the motion of the individual atoms and molecules that make of an object. Uh, in the same way that gravity is a force that tends to pull an object from a higher to a lower position, in most instances in nature, the tendency is for atoms and molecules to get quote unquote pulled down to lower states of potential energy. In other words, high potential energy can be seen as being an unstable state, lower potential energy as a more stable state. So a system with high potential energy therefore will have a tendency to change in a direction that lowers its potential energy. So as we see here on the picture, a 10 kilogram weight poised here at the edge of the roof is in a high potential energy or unstable state. So its tendency will be to allow gravity to pull it down. Now, when it does, what will happen is that energy is converted into the energy of motion, which is kinetic energy, until the object hits the pavement below. Now, when it hits the pavement below, what's going to happen is it will have lower potential energy. It'll be more stable. But at the same time, some energy got transferred to the pavement in the form of heat. Now, it's very important we distinguish between these two things. Thermal energy is the energy associated with the temperature of an object. In other words, the kind of average of all the kinetic energies of all the particles that make up that object, atoms, molecules, whatever. Now, when we say heat, we're referring to thermal energy that is transferred during a process. So in this case, that potential energy that that 10 kilogram weight had when it was kind of standing there on the ledge of the roof of the building has been converted now into the kinetic energy of the motion all the way down to the pavement and into the heat that was transferred onto the pavement. And this brings us to a very important statement, which is the law of conservation of energy. Energy is always conserved in a physical or chemical change. It is neither created nor destroyed. So for example, when we drive a car, we start with a fuel, a gasoline that has molecules in a high potential energy state. They're unstable. As we pump the gasoline into the engine and we spark and we burn the gasoline, that energy is now converted into the work that causes the car to move forward. The remaining molecules after that chemical reaction of combustion happens are present in the exhaust. These are molecules that have lower energy. But if we could add up all of the energy that was contained, in the molecules in the exhaust, plus the work that was done in moving the car, plus the heat that was transferred to the engine block, which had to be cooled down by the uh, uh, radiator, by the uh, you know cooling system in the car. All of that should add up to the same energy that was present in those molecules in the gasoline fuel. That's because of the law of conservation of energy. Now we will revisit all these principles later on the semester in a deeper way. The reason I'm giving you this intro is to remind us that ultimately we really don't measure energy. We calculate it. What we really measure is temperature. Temperature is a way of assessing an index of the average kinetic energy of the atoms or molecules of a substance. And just like with the other properties that we studied before, we have different ways of measuring. In the English system, which is the one we use, we're typically used to uh, Fahrenheit scale. And in the metric system, we use the Celsius scale. The 
international system utilizes a unit that's called a Kelvin, which is part of what we call the absolute scale of temperature, and we'll discuss that later in the semester. As I said, technically we don't measure energy. What we measure or calculate is heat, which is the kinetic energy transferred during a physical or chemical change. And the way we calculate that is by measuring the changes in temperature of substances or objects. A thermometer doesn't measure heat directly. It measures the temperature, which is a scale, like as we, as we said, is an index of the average kinetic energies of the atoms and molecules that make up the substance. Now, once we do the calculations, we'll find that once more we have different units of energy. In both the metric and the uh, English or common system, which sometimes use the calorie, abbreviated CAL, uh, this is the amount of energy that is required to increase the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. The SI system uses a unit called the Joule, capital J. One calorie equals 4.184 joules. Now, be careful not to confuse these calories with a small c with food calories with an uppercase or capital C. A food calorie, the ones that you see in the ingredients uh, label on, let's say, food products, uh, represents, each food calorie represents, I'm sorry, 1,000 of these uh, calories that we've defined here based on the English and metric system. Uh, you can see here the different uh, scales of temperature. In the uh, Celsius scale, of course, we use the freezing point of water. We set that as zero degrees Celsius and the boiling point of water at 100. And we divide that range into 100 equal spaces or intervals, meaning that each space is 1.00 degrees Celsius. Notice that in the Fahrenheit scale, those uh, numbers are different, and so it is in the absolute zero scale. For the moment, let's remember how to convert between these. It's a very simple formula here. Since a Fahrenheit degree is about five-ninths the size of a Celsius degree, and the Celsius degree and the Kelvin degrees are the same size, we can use these formulas to convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius, and then between Celsius and Kelvin. We'll explore these formulas a little more later on, and you'll have an exercise where you get to practice the use of them. Now, one of the things that we're gonna find when we study matter is that there are many values in the measurements that we make that really are incredibly huge. Let's say the number of molecules of water in a teaspoon of water or numbers that are exceedingly small, like the distance between the nucleus and the electrons in an atom of hydrogen. These are very, very large or very, very small values. And so to express them in decimal notation would introduce many errors. Therefore, we use what is called scientific or exponential notation, where you write numbers in the form of a number times a power of 10, a times 10 to the nth. Uh, the number a, we're going to call it the coefficient, sometimes called the significant, and it has to be a number between 1 and 10. And then the superscripted number n to the right of the 10 is called the exponent. So here is an, ex uh, an example of a number written in scientific or exponential notation. 7.5, right, that's the coefficient, a number between 1 and 10, times 10 to the negative 6, which is the exponent. So please remember that a positive exponent means that the decimal period in the coefficient would have to be moved to the right in order to change this into a decimal notation. And a negative exponent means that the number is less than one and therefore to express it in decimal notation, you would move the decimal period on the coefficient to the left. If you have any questions on your textbook, Appendix 1, there's a review of all this stuff in case you've forgotten how to do this, all right? Now, the importance of scientific notation is not only that it helps us express numbers that might have very small or very large values, but it allows us to use the powers of 10 as multipliers. So in the international system, for example, we're gonna have multipliers that are put in as prefixes to our units of measurements to, uh, 
basically navigate between different uh, ranges of values in measurements. So each mul the multipliers change the value of the unit by powers of 10, kind of the same way the exponent does in scientific notation. For example, when I say a kilometer, that prefix kilo in front of the standard unit of measurement, which is the meter, means that I am working in the ranges of thousands of meters, or 10 to the third power. Each one of these uh, prefixes has a multiplier associated with it, and so we have them in here in this table. And for the metric system, you're going to be required to memorize the following. We're going to memorize between pico on the smaller end, 10 to the minus 12, all the way to giga, which is 10 to the 9th on the macro scale here. All right? These are the ones that you'll have to memorize. You need to memorize the prefix, the symbol for it, and what kind of multiplier it represents. Mainly, if you can memorize or remember the actual 10 to the nth power, that'll probably be easier to memorize, all right? Okay, so that is our introductory material. In our next section, we're going to talk about the reliability, the way that we actually make and record measurements. I'll see you soon.